church. I want to invite you to stand and worship with us. Glad to see you here.
Amen. We're glad you're here at the Heights. We're going to teach you a new song.
our hearts and our minds open as your word is brought before us. God, in whatever that we're going through, when we're weak, you said to give it to you and you'll help us through. I pray that you lead us and guide us in the next week up to me. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise. What do you think? Amen. That was awesome. That was awesome. They did such a good job of pointing us in the right direction this morning, and I'm very thankful for that. I really, really am. And uh, we appreciate all of you being here and all of you that uh, may be watching by live stream. Hope you'll be uh, staying with us throughout this. And uh, we're going to pray at the end, for anyone who may have sickness, you can stand and represent them at that point. We've got uh, several. We pray for at 8 o'clock that we got word off this morning that have been having various things that they're dealing with. So we'll be praying, and others online have left messages to pray for them. So we'll do that at the end. I want to, I'm going to be looking at, as I preach, I'm going to be reading Scripture from Acts 4. And if you got a means to turn to Acts 4, you can. But I want to begin with a question. And uh, the question I, I really want you to think hard about, and I really want to be kind of a guiding question that you keep at the forefront of your mind as I preach. I really do. And so that you can, by the end, uh, it might be different, it might be the same. But the question is this. Are you a bold Christian, follower of Christ, or are you a fearful, fearful, or even cowardly Christian? Think about that for a moment. Are you a bold Christian, or are you a fearful or even cowardly Christian? There used to be a question when I was when I was a lost man and I would go to church occasionally, and then after I came to Christ, a lot of the pr preachers that where I was at would ask this question uh, at the end of the service. They'd say, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would they have enough evidence to convince, convict you? And uh, I hadn't used that in a long time, but it's a, good, it's a real good question. Uh, would they have enough evidence to convict you? But are you a bold Christian or are you a fearful, maybe even cowardly Christian? Because what I want to talk about here is how to experience boldness in the face of adversity, how to experience boldness uh, in the midst of the chaos. Uh, and I want to use, I want us to begin here by looking at three verses in this Acts 4. We'll, you'll hear them over and over again, but I don't look at them because I'm looking at this word boldness. And the first word, uh, it's used three times in the passage I'm going to be using. And the first verse is Acts 4.13. So I'm going to read these verses. Acts 4.13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. And then in Acts 4, 29, and now Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. And then Acts 4, 31, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Three times he used the word boldness. First time he uses the connection and association with God the Son, the second time with God the Father, and the third time with God the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so we want to look at this. And again, the question is, are you a bold believer? Or are you a fearful or fear-filled, maybe even cowardly Christian? I talked about last week getting in the race. You know, don't be knocked down. Don't be knocked out. Don't be running a, your own race. Run the race that's set before you. 
Get back up if you've been knocked out. Get back up if you've been distracted and been dawdling around. It's time to run the race. And I appreciate so much the commitments that people have let, let me know they've made. But I'll say, if you're going to get busy running the race that's set before us, looking into Jesus, listen, you must be a bold disciple of Jesus Christ. If you're going to run that race, there's no other choice. You've got to be a bold disciple of Jesus Christ. So what is boldness there for? What, what is it? What, what is it in the first place? Well, boldness is not arrogance. Okay? Let's get this out of the way. It's not arrogance. It's not the ability to put your finger in somebody's face and give them a good telling off. That's not boldness. That's just anger out of control. That's all it is. Uh, it's not being, boldness is not being rude and crude uh, as it is. Some, think, some people think they're, uh, that they're being bold when they're just being arrogant and in their face with anger and they got their face all scrunched up and they're, they're red in the face and their veins are coming out and they're giving you what for all in Jesus' name. That's not boldness. Instead, you know what that does, right? It pushes people away. It pushes people away. Just turns more people off than brings them to the Lord. Let me tell you what boldness is in the New Testament. We're going to look at that word boldness for just a moment here in the New Testament. Let me give you an example from Paul's writings in 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. And as you may be looking at that, I'll, I'll just remind you in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth, right? The word meek there means power under control. That's what it means. It means something that has great power, great strength, but it's reined in, okay? Now listen to 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. As the Lord's servant, you must not quarrel. You must, not, you must be kind towards all, a good and patient teacher, gentle as you correct your opponents, for it may be that God will give them the opportunity to repent and come to know the truth. And then they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who had caught them and made them obey his will. I don't know how many of you had people like I did that, man, they got in my face. I thought I was going to fight, you know, and I could argue with the best of them. But when I came to know Jesus, I was delivered. That, that verse really speaks to me because I, I escaped the trap of the devil and I, I, I learned better, right? And, and so he says you're to be gentle as you correct your opponents for it, it may be that God's trying to get them to the kingdom just like he did you. Please don't think that if you go around getting in people's faces, that's necessarily bold, okay? Boldness is having the faith, the confidence, the courage of Christ in the face of intimidation and opposition to stand for him, the Lord Jesus Christ, in spite of that intimidation, in spite of that opposition that's coming. If you want to get a good example of what it is to be a Christian in a hostile government, in a hostile place where the government doesn't really like the church and whatever, read the book of Daniel. It's an awesome read on this. Matter of fact, I want to give you an example from it. Daniel 6, verses 7 through 10. Daniel 6, verses 7 through 10. And this is what he says. The supervisors, assistant governors, <coughs> governors, the people who advise you and the captains of the soldiers have all agreed that you should make a new law for everyone to obey. For the next 30 days, no one should pray to any God or human except to you, O king. Anyone who doesn't obey will be thrown into the lion's den. Now, o king, make the law and sign your name to it so that it cannot be changed because then it will be a law of the Medes and the Persians and cannot be canceled. So King Darius signed the law. Daniel, what did he do? Did he organize a protest? Hmm. Don't see him burning down no buildings or trying to poison the lines. What do you do? Look at verse 10. Here's your boldness. 
even though Daniel knew that the new law had been written, he went to pray. <laughs> he went to pray in an upstairs room in his house, which had windows that opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he would kneel down to pray and thank God just as he had always done. That's boldness. That's boldness right there. That's, that's continuing on with his relationship with the holy God regardless of what anybody says or any law. Did he end up being in the lion's den? He sure did, but God delivered him and ended up delivering the king. You see, this is, this is what I'm talking about here. This is real boldness in print. The boldness is the boldness we see in Acts 4. Now, I want to get back to Acts 4. Uh, in this particular passage that I'm going to be reading throughout this message, it really starts back in chapter 3. And because in chapter 3, Peter and John are on their way to pray. And this, they come upon this man this, uh, that they healed. His, he was lame from birth, and Peter and John healed him right there at the beautiful gate, which is a, a gate that's right on the east side leading into the temple, and it's made of Corinthian brass. It was really glorious. It was very beautiful. And this poor beggar uh, who's crippled from birth, lame from birth, is on the outside of that temple, the wrong side, and he's begging for money. And when Peter looks at him and sees him, he says in verse 6 of chapter 3, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rock, rise up and walk. Now, he was instantly healed. He was instantly healed. A miracle was done, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and a whole lot of others who hated Jesus Christ, whose hearts were filled with pride, uh, they couldn't deny the miracle. And so they thought to themselves, okay, we, we can't deny it because he's standing here beside the disciples. So we may not be able to cover it up, but what we can do is control it and contain it. We're just going to stop it right in its tracks so that it doesn't get any bigger. And so they arrested Peter and John. They brought them in, and they told them this in Acts 4, 17 through 18. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. This name is Jesus. So they called them and charged them to not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. The only thing is that didn't really work too well for them. Because if you look at verse 19 and 20, it says, but Peter and John answered them. Now let's look at the boldness, but yet the gentleness and, and the, and the Christ-likeness of this answer. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right or in the sight of God, to listen to you or that rather than God, you must judge. Do you see what they just did? They, they put that back on them. They, they didn't say, you bunch of good-for-nothing creeps. Man, you ain't telling me what to do. I'll knock your teeth out. That's more like what I would have said, you know, at times in my life. But they say, they say whether it's right or wrong, or right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we... We can't speak of what we, we cannot help but speak of what we have both seen and heard. He said, man, we, you, you can't stop us because we just got to keep doing it. But they did it in a gentle way. Holy Spirit boldness began up in verse 8 of chapter 4. Now, you got to remember this is Simon Peter um, uh, talking. He's not coward, cowardly anymore. He's not denying Jesus and I want to begin it in verse 8 and read through verse 13. This is what it says. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him 
this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So I want to look, coming off of this, at, uh, you know, we're answering that question, am I a bold Christian or am I a fear-filled Christian believer, maybe even a cowardly believer? I'm going to look at three truths on how you can be truly bold in the face of adversity. And I want to begin even with these three truths. And the first truth is this. You have to keep daily fellowship or company with God the Son, Jesus. You have to keep daily fellowship, company with Jesus. If you look back in chapter 4, verse 13, now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived they were uneducated, common men. They were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. You can't walk with Jesus Christ on a daily basis and still be full, filled with fear. You just can't do it. You can't walk daily uh, on a daily basis with Jesus and be a secret Christian. You just can't. Make certain, therefore, that what you know as a believer is that you really do have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that he is as real to you as anything in the world, that you have turned away from everything else and trusted in him alone. Because it is about relationship and not religion. It is about knowing forgiveness and love of God, being reconciled unto God, and looking forward to a future. No one else, you see, knows what we know as believers that what Jesus in Matthew 18, 20 said, for where two or three are gathered in my, my, my name, there I am among them. Now, if you're a believer, he's in us, right? But when we gather together, two or three, whether, whether it's a small group or a Sunday school class or a Bible study group or a CR support group or this worship God, Jesus, he's here. Je Jesus is in his place right now. Right. Now, the question is, are you aware of it? You see, I'm convinced that when we become aware that Jesus is in the house, we don't have to ask him to come in. He's in the house. Where two or three are gathered, he's in the house. In the presence here, do you realize we sing differently? We'll sing differently. I'm just going to tell you. You will sing differently. You won't be looking around you. You'll be looking to Jesus. You'll be worshiping him. You'll be singing to him. And, and, and it's because he is with us is the reason that we witness to other people. It's the reason that we go on missions, to not only in our state, our county, but the United States and even across the world, we go there because he is with us. And we know that we can go and share the word. Remember this in Matthew 28, 18 through 20? Let's hear it with fresh ears this morning. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, look at this, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You see, here's the interesting thing. We get all up in the air. I understand it. Because we can't carry a Bible into our workplace, or we can't, our kids can't carry a Bible into school, or they can't wear a Jesus shirt, or we've been told to get off a plane because 
we got a Jesus shirt on or, you know, we got a track stick in our pocket and we get all riled up and we, you know, a lot of people get on Facebook and they're just, man, what we need to go take it over, man, we got to do it. But, but let me give you a different take on it, okay? I've, I've got been to Ukraine 24, 25 times over 24 years or so, 23 years. Poland and Germany and various other places. But here's the thing. Flying back, when you enter into the country, we usually fly into New Jersey or, or New York, you can't bring any agricultural products into America from another country. You can't, you can't do it. They ain't going to let you do it. And so I can remember one time I had this cherry stuff that I really liked and a little thing of this honey that uh, I, I liked. And I was going to bring it in. He said, no, you're not going to bring it in. I said, really? You got to? He said, did, you not, did they not talk to you about this on the plane? Did you not get a piece of paper explained to it? I said, yeah, I did, but is that what you're talking about? He said, yeah, give it to me. So I don't know what they did with it. I imagine somebody had some good cherry stuff with honey. <laughs> but I, I, it, what really amazed me is I was reading a story Along this line, and I, it was familiar to me because I've flown in a lot of times. There was this man who came in, and we got up to the security. You know, they got their security guys, man, the, the, the people that are standing there making sure everything's good. And he asked this guy, he says, man, you've got on here, you've got gourmet cheese. Yes, you can't bring it in. He said, oh, yeah, I can he said, no, sir, you can't. It's very plain. And he pointed it out and circled it. He said, so you'll need to, to get, give it to us and we will dispose of it. He said, no, I'm going to bring it in. He said, no, sir, you're not. You're not bringing the cheese into America. He said, I am. He said, no, sir, you're not. So he stepped back. He got back midway in the line, unwrapped his cheese. And ate every bit of it. <laughs> Watered it up, threw it in the paper. He says, I'm going to take my cheese in, just rewrapped. <laughs> right? I wish I'd have thought of that. Man, I can just see me now up there in New Jersey just eating that honey like crazy. I'm bringing it in. <laughs> you know. Why do you say that? Because listen to me, if you know Jesus, Jesus is in you. And if you put the word of God in your heart, like David said, that you might not sin against him, let me tell you something. There ain't no one can keep Jesus or his word out. Not your work, not your school, not your restaurant, not your government. There's nobody can stop you. They can't, they can't do it. He is in you. Listen, it don't matter if you got a Jesus t-shirt. I've known people wear Jesus t-shirts. I wanted to go jerk it off with my knife, just cut the out of it and say, Change your ways or change your name. Don't wear this shirt no more. You've known people like that, right? I mean, man, when I see somebody out with a Jesus shirt on, they can barely stand up. They, they out here like this, man. Y'all know You know, like this. We got a big Jesus shirt. You can ask my wife. I'll say, turn that boy out inside out, man. Don't be wearing that shirt. But if Jesus is really in here and his word is in you, Who's going to stop it? Who, who's going to stop it? You see, this is, this is the point that Jesus in us, the word of God hidden in us, no one, no place can keep him out he, when he's in us. And, the, and this is the truth that someone told me, and, I, and it's true, and this is what, what it says. Jesus didn't come to get you and me as his disciples out of trouble. He came to be with us in trouble to be with you and me always. You see, there's so many believers today that, that think that because they're Christians, they should be removed from all problems. I mean, I'm having people right now saying, come, Lord Jesus, come, because I'm getting out of here and leaving behind. You know an interesting thing? And, and I challenge you to do this. I want you to start at Genesis and read Revelation, and you want me to tell you what you're going to find? God always kept his people in the midst of trouble, but he always saw them through it. Do you realize that they went through the fire? 
Do you realize they went through the water? Do you realize that with all but about one or two of the plagues in Egypt, Israel went and, do, went and endured every one of them? You see, what I'm trying to say is that we're trying to live in a, in a, a kind of Christianity that is so timid and so fearful that we don't realize that the only time that trouble and pain is going to leave us is when we get to heaven. And when we get there, there's no more of that. And we wouldn't come back to this earth for nobody's business. But while we're here, Jesus is with us. You realize that if you're a believer, Jesus is with you. He will see you through and be with you the whole way. He'll never leave you. Second truth on how to be bold is you must have confidence. You must have faith in God the Father. If, you know, they told him, it says, stop preaching uh, about Jesus. But look at what he said in verse 24 and 29. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles, the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined, had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. The religious leader said, don't speak in his name anymore. Don't, don't do it. They prayed, oh, oh God, what'd they do? They turned around and said, they prayed, oh God, oh sovereign Lord, just give us more power to do exactly what they told us to stop doing. You see, that to me is the power. You have to get focused on the best things uh, in all things and in all circumstances. You have, to get, you have to get focused on the best. No matter what circumstances come into our lives, no matter what comes into our lives, if you don't rightly focus, listen, folks, the devil is going to have you on the run. You're going to be full of anxiety. You're going to be full of uh, fear. You're going to be in constant turmoil. It's not a good place to be. But when you focus on the sovereign God uh, and who he really is in Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, you will be able to be bold and stand no matter what comes your way. The man or the woman who can willfully who can and will, let me put this, who can and will kneel in submission to the Lord, the sovereign God, the one who can do that before God will stand before anyone. Will stand before anyone. You see, if we have a holy fear of God, knowing that he is sovereign, all other fears begin to melt away. They saw God. These disciples saw God. They had faith and confidence in God through Christ as the creator of all things. Look at verse 24. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and earth and sea and everything in them? They're saying, man, God made everything. He created everything. Folks, listen to me. God created out of nothing everything that is. And what they did when they understood that they looked at it and said, if God created everything, why am I scared? Why am I scared? And I think that's a good question. I mean, when, when, when God is your father, the creator, the controller, the sustainer, when, when he is that all in all, why in the world should we be intimidated? Why should we? What a mighty God we serve. So mighty God, they had faith. They, they, you know, they had faith. They had confidence in God as the creator of all things. And so it follows from that because he is 
the creator of all things, they saw God as in control of all things. And he is. He is in control of all things. You, you, listen, folks. I'll, I'll get to it in a minute. I want to read a verse of Scripture. Acts 2, 24 through 26. Let me read that again. So when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, against the Lord and against his anointed. Now pay attention to Acts 4, 27 through 28. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you had anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, now you got the government involved, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever, uh-oh, what are they doing? These, the government, the Gentiles, he said what? To do whatever your hand and your plan had determined or predestined to take place. Listen, folks, God is the creator of all things, and there is nothing that exists that he didn't create. And he is the con in control of all things and the sustainer of all things. Dark Gethsemane. Jesus was asking, if it's possible, deliver me from this. At Calvary, when he was unrecognizably hanging on a tree with his blood dripping from him for your sins and my sins, listen to me, God didn't make a mistake. God wasn't saying, oops, wasn't expecting that. He, he really didn't. God's never lost control, and God never says, whoops. Uh-oh, didn't know this. Now, I, I want to show you a verse and it's a verse you ought to remind yourself of because you and I are not God. He is God. And we need to understand who he is. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. He says this. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. You see, God is in control, and that ought to give us courage for the living of this day, come what may. I mean, he is the creator of all things. He's the controller of all things. He's the sustainer of all things. And therefore, he is the conqueror of all things. Evil and sin will not win. You hear what I'm saying? It will not win. Peter is quoting from Psalm 2. And, and he's talking about the kings of the earth that set themselves against the Lord. And they're just ready to go after him. We're going to win against uh, this God thing. But Psalm 2 goes further. I want to read a little bit of Psalm 2, 4 through 6. He who sits in the heavens laughs, okay? Now, you got this picture? All the rulers, the presidents, the dictators, all the governments, they all gather together. We got this big plan. We got this big plan. This is what we're going to do, okay? We all met together. Nobody knows we're going to meet. Here we go. This is what we're going to do. And here's what God's, here's what God's doing. He sits in the heavens and laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Are you kidding me? So that's what he's saying. Are you kidding me? Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I set my king on Zion, my holy hill. In other words, he said, he's talking about his son, Jesus. People say, No, it's David. Well, it's, you've got to understand the prophecy. He's talking about, he's talking about Jesus there. Now, he goes on in verse 8 and 9. And he's saying through Jesus, he's saying this, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. Talking to Jesus. I'll make all the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Folks, listen to me. 
God's in control regardless of what you may feel. Listen, you got to get the right focus. You got to get the right focus. He is in control. It doesn't make things easier in that sense. It, you still have to, I know there's things that come our way, but you don't have to be filled with fear. You don't have to be wringing your hands and, 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 and the devil sitting there going, say, God ain't so good, right? But we win. Jesus Christ is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Sin can't win. Faith can't fail. It really can't. Satan is our enemy. He wants to rob us. He wants to steal from us he, our joy. He wants to steal from us our belief. He is a murderer from the beginning, Jesus said. If he, want, he wants nothing more to render us useless. And he belongs in the lake of fire, and I promise you, he's going to be there. When Jesus Christ comes, now I know we look at the current happenings and things that happen to us uh, ourselves. We look around us. We look even across the world. And you can kind of get the idea of, man, something's wrong here because it looks to me like evil's winning. Looks to me like evil's winning to me. Evil's going unchecked. They're doing anything they want to. I've never seen the line covering up. People killing one another. It looks to me like God's failed. If God's so great, why is all this stuff happening, you know? Maybe the Bible isn't true. Maybe the Bible isn't true. Listen to me. No, no, no. Sin will not and cannot win, and faith will not and cannot fail. I'm telling you, God is on the move, and there's coming a day where the kingdoms of this world will be his kingdoms, and that will be a day of rejoicing. So the thing is, is what's our problem? I, I want you to think, listen to me. Think of the worst scenario that has happened to you, is happening to you, or will happen, or happen to this country. I mean, I've experienced quite a few that I think is the worst thing that everybody can go to, but then I live a little bit longer and I find something worse. And then a little longer and I find something worse than those two. But the, but the question is, think about it. Some of you didn't have to think long at all. But do, but do you believe that in spite of that, that God can't bring out good and his purpose out of the mess? of that worst case scenario? You mean to tell me that you don't have the faith and the confidence in God that he is working, as Romans 8 says, 28, that he is working in all things to bring about good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That doesn't necessarily cure our pain. It doesn't necessarily cure a little bit of anxiety, but I'm going to tell you something. If you look to him and trust him, you trust him. It's the only way you can do it without fear and anxiety and being torn apart. It's the only thing that will enable you to keep on going in a world that, that does sometimes seem that way. The basis of our boldness as believers in Christ is we've got to keep daily company, daily fellowship with God the Son, Jesus Christ. We've got to have our faith and confidence in him, God the Father. And when these believers were terrified, they took their eyes off of man and put it back on Christ. When they got scared and standing there, they started looking to Jesus rather than those who were persecuting him. Write this verse down, Proverbs 29, 25. This is what the word says. Being afraid of people can get you into trouble, but if you trust the Lord, you'll be safe. Being afraid of people can get you in trouble, or being afraid of people can be a snare to you. But if you trust the Lord, you'll be safe. 
Take your eyes off your problems. Take your eyes off the problems and focus them upon Almighty God who is the creator of all things, the controller of all things, the sustainer of all things, and the conqueror of all things. But here's the third truth. You must receive courage from God and live out of that courage. Uh, let me rephrase that. You must receive courage from God, the Holy Spirit, and live in and out of that courage. You must receive courage from God the Holy Spirit and live in and out of that courage. It's not enough just to receive something. I know a lot of people know the Word of God but don't live it. I know a lot of, God, of people who do that. A lot of people who receive something but they never use it. And this is where it goes, Acts 4, 29, 31. He says, Now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of the whole, your holy, ser, holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. You see, we talked about uh, the son, we talk about boldness with the son and the son being with him and boldness by the focus on God the Father. And now we learn that it is the Holy Spirit of God who gives us the courage that we need to live for him. Notice what they said. Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. That word Servant there is uh, thulos, which, which means servant, bond servant is another word that's more similar to that, but it also means slave, made a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you and I are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have become his servants. We have become his slave. Boldness, you see, is not for rebels. Boldness is not for those who choose to live their own way. That's a different kind of boldness. You will never have true boldness until you can say to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, grant me, give to me boldness. Give to me your servant. Give to me your bondservant boldness. Now, if there's any unconfessed sin in your life or any area of your life that you've not surrendered unto him, you're not going to have his boldness. He's needing us to be able to deal with the issues that are him. We don't hold on to those things. We don't, you see, some, I see some believers who come in and they, they keep back a little, what I call a little attic or a basement door. They just keep that back. Okay, you have access to my whole life, but just stay, right, stay away from this right here because this is, this is for me. I, I need this. I got to hold on to this. And God is going, no, nah, I want to I wanna be on it all. I want it all. Listen to what Proverbs 28, 1 says. Proverbs 28, 1 says this. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. The wicked, I wonder if the wicked are running away because they're thinking, I wonder if they've heard about me and what I did. I, I wonder if they know this secret I've got. I wonder if they found out something about me, so I better just keep my mouth shut and walk away from this thing because if they do, I, I, man, that could be an embarrassing thing. And we flee, but nobody's pursuing. But when you can wake up in the morning in Christ and there's nothing between you and Jesus that you're, you're a regular on, uh, as 1 John 1, 9 says, confessing your sin and let him cleanse you from it. He's already cleansed you in his blood. He just wants you to own up what you've done. And you can look at him and say, Jesus, here I am. I'm picking up my cross. I'm going to follow you. I'm your servant. Jesus, you're with me. God the Father is above me. You are uh, around me. And the Holy Spirit of God, you're in me. Give me, give me boldness to share your word and stand as bold as a lion. I'm telling you, that's where you win. That's where you win. What did they ask courage for? 
What do they really want boldness for? You notice this? They wanted boldness to preach, teach, and witness, just witness to the work of, uh, to the word of God, the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, so, so may I say this? The cure for all that has got everybody going here and there, the division and everything, you want me to tell you what it is? It's the gospel. It is Jesus Christ. I, I'm going to tell you something. You get Jesus in you, you ain't going to be prejudiced. Oh, but I know, I know Christians who are prejudiced. No, you don't. Jesus in you changes the way you look at other people. Jesus in you changes the way you think about people, talk about people, treat people. When you get Jesus in you, forgiveness comes to the forefront because you've been forgiven. When you get Jesus in you, you want to tell somebody else what Jesus has done for you. But we think we just need to write books and read books and we need laws and we need this and there's no doubt there's some laws to be made because of some things. But I'm just telling you, people say, all you preachers are just so simple. All you think is Jesus will cure everything. <laughs> Guilty. I just do. I mean, I'm looking out of the congregation of people that, that have, at one time were captured in deep sin. I'm talking about deep sin. And now they're sitting in a church praising God and actually listening, taking notes. They're paying attention. I, I know that I've seen people who have been caught up in sin, who've had relationships destroyed because of their sin. I've seen people who have been addicted to a variety of things and now they're free. I've seen people in this congregation who have been religious people who could check off every box but then one day they met Jesus and threw away the paper. I know that Jesus can take a man who was eat up with anger and bitterness and holding grudges and wanted to jack everybody that looked his wrong way wrong and turn him into somebody who can stand before you and tell you that that's not the way. Jesus is the way. You see, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep all that you and I give to him against the day of judgment. I think that the curse that we have today is our culture has so intimidated the church that we just don't want to share what Jesus has done for us. We'd just rather get kind of entertained, you know? And it's like one man told me, I just want to live my life. Just let, everybody leave me alone. Just let me live my life. Do what I'm going to do. And we've done that for a long time, haven't we? That's going to change. I mean, you just might as well gear up. It, it's going to change. And, and so reality is, if you look at these apostles, they didn't ask for their safety. They asked for courage. They asked for more power and boldness to do what they had been told not to do in the first place and got them into trouble. And so my prayer for me and for every one of you who is a woman or man of God in Christ to be filled with courage. I, I'm, I'm praying for more and more pastors to be so filled with the Holy Spirit of God that it's more about telling people about Jesus and getting people to know Christ than it is making videos. The disciples wanted courage just to tell somebody about Jesus. They wanted courage to extend his church, extend his kingdom. And so I pray that God will do that. You realize in this, they say, Lord, extend your hand and heal people and with powerful signs. Isn't that what Paul said? He said, I come with you not with eloquence, but with signs and wonders. Is, this, is that going on? Some people say, yeah, it's going on all the time. Well, you know what I've discovered in the last three weeks? 
intensive research. You know what I've discovered? A lot of it's sham. And the sham takes away from the reality. Uh, you know, when you have family members now that start coming out of these great names and they say, they, I've got, just got saved, let me tell you about what went on in there. Let me, let me tell you what, what, what went on around here. You begin to see, man, and when people see that, do you think they want to believe anything else? I'm telling you that God still does sign and wonders. I've seen him heal right here with no fake, nothing about it. And we didn't go up and ask you for $300 to get you a miracle. It just happened because it's God who does the healing, not, uh, not us. It's amazing to me that they asked this. And if you look at chapter 5, verse 12, it says, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were together in Solomon's portico. And then in verse 29 and 30, the Lord, look upon our threats and grant your service, continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant. That's exactly what happened. They got filled with the Spirit. What happened? The place where they were praying was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. And in verse 33, it says, with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Listen, folks, if ever there was a time that was needed for true believers who are willing to take the Jesus in them and the word in them wherever they go, and as God gives opportunity to share that with someone, it's now. My prayer right now for Catawba Heights, it's a prayer for all churches, but I'm praying for us that, that are believers, that we'll get so full of the Spirit of God and so bold in these rough times that wherever we go in our neighborhood or wherever, we'll take Jesus. Not quarrel and argue and get all burnt up, you know, with it, but just in a gentle way, this is what Jesus did for me, come to know Christ. This is, this is what Jesus is, to explain to people who Jesus really is, that there is no other name under heaven whereby a person can be saved but Jesus. My, my prayer is and my challenge to this church is and we'll take seriously this fact that the way we change our community and change America is this, one person transformed by Jesus at a time. Amen. One person by one, by one, by one, by one, by one. And then you've got people who've come for the right reason because Jesus changed their life. Jesus changed their life. Would you bow with me as we pray? For any of you here that have never trusted Christ, listen to me. Jesus is coming. I don't know when he's coming. He may come today. He may come next year. He may be 10 years. From, I don't know. I don't know when death's coming either. But I do know that after you die, you don't have another chance of salvation. I don't care what anybody tells you. And when he comes and busts that sky wide open, I'm going to tell you something, too late. Today, Paul said, is the day of salvation. And so if you've never trusted Christ, there's no other way you can be saved. Listen, the Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess your mouth, I believe that confession is prayer, that you will be saved. And I'm just asking you right now just to pray. You can pray after me. You can change it the way you want to pray it. But listen, don't wait. This is the time right now. This is it to get in, man, to get into Christ. And begin to know his safety, bold as a lion. Just pray this way. God, I am a sinner. And I realize that my sin deserves your judgment. But God, have mercy on me. I need mercy. I want mercy. And I'm willing right now to turn from my sin and to turn to you, Lord Jesus. 
I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you paid for my sin with your blood on the cross. Tell him. I believe, Jesus, that God raised you from the dead. And now by faith, this very moment, Jesus, I'm trusting you as my Savior, my Lord. And I'm asking you to come in to my life. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. Save me, Lord Jesus. I give you my life. Help me to be bold in the faith. Now you thank him. Thank him for it. Praise his name. Praise his name. Listen, you want, you want, to, you want to let others know that. You want to find a place you can worship. You want to play, find a place where you can get in a, in a Bible study group, whether it's men, women, whatever. I'm just, you, you want to let somebody know so they can pray for you, and we'd love to do that. You just let us know. You can write your name down and leave it with us as you go out the door this morning, or you can write it down in the comment section there on the live stream and someone will respond. I, I'm just praying, don't keep it a secret. Don't be that secret Christian. Don't be that fear-filled Christian. Oh, I don't want nobody to know because what if I don't do it? No, you either all in or you're not. Let's go. And Father, I'm asking right now in Jesus' name on behalf of my brothers and sisters that there's some, dear God, that realize that they've been thinking about that question we began with and they realize that there's a whole lot more fear and apprehension, afraid somebody's going to ask a question that they can't answer or afraid somebody's going to attack them. I know there's a lot of things, but God, you're the one who shows us when we have the opportunity. And I'm just praying for my brothers and sisters in Christ to so commit themselves to you, to that daily fellowship with you, the, the, to begin to put their faith and focus on you, Father, and to live and work and walk out of the courage you give, O Holy Spirit of God, that they will take every moment and every chance they get to tell someone about how Jesus changed their life. I pray, dear God, in so uncertain times that you will show yourself mighty on behalf of your name. And that, God, we will see multitudes of people's lives changed because one person told another person about Jesus. God, I pray that Catawba Heights, the Heights Church, that we will lift up Jesus in all that we say or do. Forgive me, oh God, if I've spoken anything I should not have. Grant unto me that I may speak your word as you desire it to be. Before I close, God, I ask you, please, there's so many in our church. There's many out here that have family or friends that are sick, family or friends still grieving. You've got, we've got such a, a wide prayer list that we could go on for hours naming names, but I'm asking you, God, to bring healing to those who need healing, consolation and comfort to those who need that. We're praying, dear God, that you'll do it for your sake. There's some that God may be taken off a ventilator and it's almost certain death, and maybe that's already happened. I don't know. But I know, God, that you're able to have somebody come off a ventilator, get up an hour or two later, and be headed out the door. And, and I just pray, God, in Christ's name, that you, through it all, it'll be you that gets the glory and honor. For those that are present right now that have health needs or financial needs or job needs, I'm praying, God, that they will see you working on their behalf and you will help them in these matters. I give you our church. I give you, dear God, this day. Thank you for everyone who is in this place and watching. May you be pleased. And we have asked these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I love you, folks. God bless you. I hope you have a great one.